I'll give you a little background on Steve Nelson. Uh, according to his LinkedIn, he is a real estate broker uh, at Stratum Real Estate. Uh, in typical Steve fashion, this is vastly underselling who he is and what he does. So he is one of the founders of Stratum Real Estate that now employs 44 different real uh, realtors. He's a hotelier, so he owns a, a ho owned two hotels. One, uh, the Stratford has become student housing. Um, he's very busy in the community as well, so he serves um, the, uh, as on, on the board of the local Realtors Association. Um, I'm blanking on GPA. What is GPA? Gateway Preparatory. Gateway Academy. Preparatory Academy. That's right. Great. <laughs> Gateway Prepar Pre Preparatory Academy, uh, charter school chairman of the board. Uh, he is uh, uh, the Surf Soccer Club uh, president. Uh, I, I, as I was uh, doing a little research, I, I looked at Stratum Real Estate's mission statement, and I read it, and I thought, this is this is Steve Nelson. This is, so I'm going to read you the mission statement uh, because it does uh, as good a job as anything uh, to introduce to you the kind of person that Steve Nelson is. So uh, it, it, it says uh, the following. Uh, we provide the highest level of prof professionalism in the I industry by being the most informative, loyal, and dedicated real estate company. Our team approach philosophy ensures clients' needs are important. Uh, we seek the best interests of our clients and will place the client's needs and interests above our own in each and every situation as our dedication is to develop a long-term client relationship. That is 100% Steve Nelson. He genuinely puts his clients uh, and those around him above his own needs. That's partly why he dropped everything and was willing to, to speak to us today. Um, the, the mission statement goes on. We are a company of honesty, integrity, and loyalty to our clients, agents, and associates. If, if you are not satisfied, neither are we. Uh, Steve Nelson, I, I, as I thought about what I might say to introduce Steve Nelson, I really had a hard time finding the words to convey how much I admire and respect this man. I, I can just say this, I treasure every minute that I get to spend with him, and you've got some time to spend with him. I hope you'll pay attention. Uh, you will come away a better person. So. Without further ado, please welcome Steve Nelson. <clears throat> Thanks, so the real part of that story is he had his speaker cancel, and then he went down his phone, and by the very bottom, he finally was like, oh, I guess I'll call Steve. Um, so thank you, Tyler. Um, so I actually got to do this a few years ago now, and uh, I'm not... Um, I'm not a really good lecturer, I'm more of a storyteller. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about principles that I have learned or value greatly in the way that I approach life and, and business. But I'm going to do it more, and I'm just going to tell you stories about my life. Okay. So when I think about entrepreneurship or business, when I first, what first got me started into it, um, it, was, it, was, it was many years ago, but it wasn't... A family thing like a lot of entrepreneurs I think come with parents that that ran businesses own businesses and they kind of grew up with that idea of, of well, I, I can do that too that was that was not me um, my my dad was a banker and uh, and terrible with money <laughs> and so so I did not learn a whole lot of those kind of principles from him and in fact I as I grew up, I actually was going to be a school teacher was what I had planned to do. I was inspired by some really good teachers in high school, and that's what I was going to do. I uh, ended up going and serving a, a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And, and this is actually probably where my first thought about business came from. So I, um, I had two different mission presidents. Those of you that may be familiar with that, there's a, a president over the missionaries as they serve. My first one was this just really big lovey guy, like just oozed charity out of him. And uh, I, I, I felt the same way about him. My second mission president I only had for about three months and he was a venture capitalist. He had taken something like seven companies public, um, was incredibly wealthy and, uh, 
and very much an entrepreneur. So in our exit interview, as I was going home, we spent two hours, and you'd think in that environment, right, this is a religious environment, spiritual leader, you'd think that they'd talk about how, you know, you need to just go and be good and keep the commandments and, you know, go get married and all those, those kinds of things. He didn't. For two hours, he just talked about money. For two hours. And how money works and, and how, from his perspective, that money is good. The love of money is bad, but money is good if you use it for good. And that really stuck with me. And so my, I, I served in, a, in Australia, so I had like a 19-hour plane ride home <laughs> by myself. And so I, that, that last interview, that last discussion with him, I, I thought about that whole way home. And I, I started writing goals in my, in my journal. And, uh, and this is probably the foundation, honestly, of where that set my life in the trajectory it did. But my goals was I wanted to reach a point where I could get up every day and decide what I wanted to do to help people. That money was not what I had to live to work for, but that I could, I could reach a point of financial stability where I could decide every day how I wanted to spend my time in serving and helping other people. And I set a goal. By 30 years old, I was going to be at that point where I had enough passive income that I could, that I could live off of that and choose to do whatever I wanted to every day. Um, <clears throat> so that was my goal. I came home. I enrolled in my first business class. It was accounting. And I changed my major back to education after that business class. <laughs> Accounting's like a foreign language. Does anybody have accounting? I don't understand it at all. It's terrible, huh? I hated, I hated accounting. So that took me out of business, actually. So I went back into teaching. That's what I ended up graduating in, and I taught high school um, here locally for a few years. Um, while I was doing that, um, I, I, I grew up doing construction. So from when I was like 14 years old, I worked for this old general contractor that we literally built houses from ground up. So I learned how to excavate, pour foundations, frame, plumb, electrical. I could do everything from top to bottom on a house. And so when I was teaching school. I'm so sorry. Can you meander closer to this microphone? Yes. This one's not working. That one is. This is to the other room. So oh, OK. I'll hang out over here. Sorry, you guys over there. I don't get to come hang out by you. Um, so anyway, so I would. Uh, in the summer times, I would find old beater houses and I'd fix them up and I'd keep them as rentals or, or uh, resell them. And that was how I really made any kind of income. Because as a school teacher, I started at $24,000 a year and I coached. So I got some extra there, um, a whole extra, like about $3,000. I calculated that one time and it came out to about three cents an hour <laughs> for how much time I spent as a coach. Um, so, but, but the passive side was going to be built. So I didn't give up on, on what I felt. My, my dream or my passion of reaching that, that uh, sense of financial security and, and have that passive income by the time I was 30, I didn't give up on that. But instead, it came through real estate. So I would find these rentals and I, and I would end up fixing them up and keeping them. And that's, that was where I still focused in that way, even though I was a school teacher rather than an entrepreneur, right? Um, so that, uh, that went well. We, uh, we reached a, a point where, uh, where, where things were going good. We had a home that we had a rental in the basement. We were living in the upstairs. We'd had our first kid and my wife was teaching as well at the time. And we decided that after that one year of, of her teaching, she decided she didn't want to continue to work. She wanted to stay home and, and be with our kids. So I did one year with just the single income and the, and the little bit of rental income that we had at that time and decided that that was not going to reach my goals <laughs> very fast. And so we decided to make a, a career shift and I uh, jumped into real estate. I, I got my real estate license and, and the plan was I was going to keep teaching. I just do real estate on the side because teaching was safe and, and, and consistent. And real estate was risky and commission-based. So, so I was just going to keep teaching and do it on the side. So I got my license in about March of that, that year. And uh, 
about, it was about, I think it was the end of April, uh, I brought home my first commission check and it was half of what I made as a teacher. <laughs> and I quit teaching. <laughs> Um, so, so that's kind of what I transitioned into, into real estate. And, uh, and I, but the, the beginning, I'll kind of back up just a little bit, that first house that we bought, and this is maybe the next principle that I, I feel. The first one is, is that I, I believe very strongly is to, to do good above all else. Right, that's the number one, and, and I believe that money can help you do more good if you use it in that way. Um, second one is what I learned as I was teaching school and working on those houses. So I would go to school and teach from, I have to be there by about 7 o'clock in the morning, get done with that about 3, 3.30, then I would coach until about 5, 5.30. And then I would go to work on these houses until 10, 11 o'clock at night, and then I'd do it again the next day. So literally for about two to three years, that was my schedule. Every day, that was my schedule. And, and this is another principle that I believe very strongly. To be successful in life, and I don't care if you're an entrepreneur, if it's just you're, you want to be a good employee and do good in a job, work harder than anybody else. There is no substitute for work ethic, none. And I'm telling you as, as an employer, it's really hard to find people that understand that and believe in work at all. They're always looking for the easy buck, the, the quick deal, the, you know, and a lot of people get into real estate thinking that too. Real estate's easy, I'll just go sell that house and make $12,000. Um, there is no easy ride, and if you truly wanna be successful, you have to work harder than anybody else. And that one thing in and of itself, if, you, if you're not the smartest guy on the planet, which is definitely me, um, you can outwork somebody and still be successful. Um, so that, that's what got me the start. So that first house, and I'll use this as kind of that transition to the next stage, is that first house that we bought, I bought it for $80,000. We gutted it from underground plumbing, not a wall in the same place, windows were gone. I have a picture of it where it was a brick house and it had the roof and, this, and the brick walls and nothing else. Windows were out. Everything else was gutted completely out of the house. And I, and I redid that from top to bottom. At that time, with just my labor, it cost me about $20,000 $20, of materials. And I did all the work myself. So we we're into it about 100000 And I sold that first house for 250000 So that got me a really good um, start financially, right, towards my, towards my, my plan or my goals. Um, but it was because I was willing to work harder than anybody else. That was a lot of hours late at night to, to accomplish that. It wasn't just going home and playing video games and watching movies at the end of the day and thinking that I worked hard that day when I went home at five. Um, so that's, that's the, uh, the first principle there. Um, so then I got, when I got into real estate, I, I then, uh, it grew really fast, a lot faster than I expected it to, and I ended up needing an assistant. I needed somebody to, to kind of help me. I was working way too many hours, and, and my wife was grumpy at me when I was showing houses on holidays and weekends, and we were, our kids were, uh, we had, the, had two kids at that point, um, so she wanted me to be home a little bit more, so I ended up hi hiring an assistant. And, and this one's a, another really cool example. So. I went in one day, she had this, so her name's Jan Wilkinson is her name, and uh, I went into work one day at six o'clock and she was hired as an hourly employee. So she was supposed to come in at eight, go home at five. That was her, her work schedule. And I go in at six and she's there. What are you doing, Jan, at six o'clock? And, and she said to me, she said, well, I, I couldn't sleep because I was worried about all these things that I needed to get done. And she'd been coming in, that wasn't the first morning, she'd been coming in early and not putting it on her time clock just because she felt like that she had more that she needed to get done than she could get done in, the, in those hours. Um, I made her my partner. <laughs> so she didn't just stay as an employee, but I literally gave her half of my, my real estate company um, 
because of that quality of a person. And that, that takes me to the next principle that I believe very strongly is in relationships, always give more than you receive. And if you think about that, Jan felt like she was just doing what she needed to do to be a good employee, right? She wasn't looking for me to pay her extra. She wasn't trying to toot her horn or tell me that she had more to do than what that could be done in the day. She just gave because she was grateful for the job. And because of that, she got half of my company because of that quality of a person I always want to have around. Um, and now, I still feel the same way. She, she gives to our relationship more than I feel like I give to her. Even though more than well over 50% of the transactions we do are still people that I bring. They're still business that I bring. So from a money standpoint, people from the outside would look and say, that's not a fair partnership. But to me, she is so hardworking, so loyal, always there to do anything that I need done, that has way greater value than just money. And then she's so grateful that I, that I uh, gave her that opportunity that she, I think she'd literally jump in front of a bus for me if, if I asked her to. And I do the same for her. Um, so that's another principle I believe very strongly. When you look at relationships, whether it's a business relationship, whether it's uh, your, your spouse, anything, if you always approach those relationships with giving more than you receive, they are much richer, fuller, and, uh, and I think mutually beneficial. It's amazing the, the I mean, when I, when I first hired Jan as an individual sales, I was probably grossing, you know, maybe $80,000 a year. Last year in our individual sales, we did almost $800,000 a year last year. So that's... With, that's an example of you, you don't stress about the money and you just care about people and, and the money takes care of itself. Um, so, anyway, so that's, that's another principle. And uh, seek to have those people in your life. And, and I feel like I've been very, very blessed uh, to, to, to find those. So from there, that was uh, getting real estate going. I did not quite reach my goal if, if by age 30 to have enough passive income to, to be able to retire. I could have done it probably a, about age 33-ish, as I, I probably could have done it at that point. Um, but instead, I, I met this crazy guy sitting on the back row that convinced me to, to keep investing and growing instead. So, um, so you, there's a guy hanging out back there under the clock, Rand Colbert, to say hi. So if, uh, if you ever get a chance, I told Tyler I need to get him to come speak to. He's an incredible man. He's uh, my partner. So a little bit down the road, I'll actually tell his story. I'll embarrass him a little bit. So Rand uh, moved to Cedar City after he graduated from dermatology school and uh, became a partner out at, uh, at Cedar Dermatology. And they went to school with one of mine and my wife Gina's uh, best friends from college. And, uh, and so when, they, when the, the Bells were their name, when they found out that Rand and, and his wife Rebecca were coming here, they called me and introduced us so I could help them find a house. Right? So his wife called me and uh, we talked on the phone one time and she hated me. <laughs> and they ended up uh, finding some other agent and, and, uh, and bought a house without me. And, uh, and so it's kind, of, it's kind of funny, a few years late, I don't know how long ago it was after you moved in, but he started coming, I played basketball in the mornings, and then he came and, and started playing basketball with our group, and, and we built a friendship actually from that. And now we laugh about how Rebecca didn't like me. <laughs> I think she's over it now. Yeah, I think we're okay now. Um, and so Rand, uh, Rand and I just developed a friendship, and one day we were, we were sitting uh, down at Central Pizza on Center Street, and I'd, I'd been looking for my real estate company had grown and we needed a new space, and we decided we wanted to try to buy a building, and we wanted it to be more downtown. So I, I went and uh, visited with uh, the economic developer, Danny Stewart, and asked him, do you know of anything? There was nothing on the market. I was hoping he maybe heard somebody that was willing to sell a building down there. 
And <clears throat> so I, he said, no, I don't, I don't really know of anything like that, but you ought to go talk to this guy named Doug Nail. And he owned, uh, what was at that time, the Best Western El Rey and the Stratford Court and, the, and the one commercial building right there on the corner. And uh, so I said, all right, I'll go, I'll go talk to him. And, uh, and he ended up, he was willing to sell. It, had, it was nothing that I really wanted to do. It wasn't in my, my picture. I was growing a real estate company. That was going really well. Uh, there was no need to do this other big crazy thing that was really a big crazy thing. And I was sitting, having dinner with, with Rand and talking to him about this crazy idea. And he was like, let's do it. <laughs> so we ended up buying um, uh, that ho those couple hotels and that, that commercial building. And then over about eight years after that, we just piece by piece would have assembled that whole block. So we, we own everything right there from, you know, where Bristlecone is and Cedar Sports, some of those places right there on Center Street. So we own everything from Maine to Center or to First West and then up through the hotel, about six acres right there. And, uh, and little by little have been working on that. And that's, that's another, uh, I guess, story or principle uh, that comes along with that. So we called our entity Guidance LLC. And, and this kind of took me back to that first experience coming back from my mission. That if you're open to really looking for ways that you can try to, to do good, it's interesting where those sometimes show themselves. And you guys may think we're really weird, but Rand and I share this passion, is we, we believe strongly that um, a good community needs a good heart. It needs a place where students and, and community members can go and, and hang out and, and uh, enjoy other people, right? Have that, that kind of social or, or personal interaction. And so we, when we bought this, it wasn't so much a, a purchase of, of, hey, let's own a bunch of property and have it make us really rich. The goal behind it was genuinely because we care about Cedar City and we want we felt like that there, it's a unique opportunity to connect downtown to the university and then try to create that atmosphere. Is anybody from here? So do you remember what was along Center Street 10 years ago? Do you remember? Yeah, okay. No? What were some of the things that were down there, Rand, when we bought it? Yep. Locksmith shop. So the buildings were were not things that had any kind of a, a vibrance or a sense of place to them. And, and so little by little, we just have kind of chipped away at trying to improve that area. Um, and we hope, does anybody go down to Bristlecone? Yeah? Hot yoga or for the coffee? <laughs> Rand's addicted to hot yoga now, so he, he goes and does hot yoga every morning. But uh, our hope is that we continue to be able to improve that and make it a place that uh, people can be. But the, the concept of that one is, again, kind of weird in that if for the first, we, we kind of joke, we, we still haven't. We've owned it now almost 10 years, right? Yeah, it is 10 years this year. Um, and we have personally not taken anything but Coke money because it's cash. So the, the soda machines will take the cash home. But the, that's, the only, that's the only money that we've taken from that multi-million dollar investment because we genuinely care about the community and want to, to we just put it back in. We keep trying to just improve it and, and make it better. And uh, that's weird. A lot of people think that that's, when I, when I tell people that, that seems kind of weird of why would we take that kind of a financial risk and, and the work. Um, to not really have any kind of a gain out of it yet. No, obviously, hopefully someday it does, but, but for now we're just trying to improve it. But again, give, give, always look to give. Um, I think I wrote, wrote a couple other notes here. Oh, this is, a, this is an interesting one. How many people in here feel like you will go into some kind of business, just out of curiosity? Okay, quite a few. I knew that because you're not all necessarily business majors though, right? Because this speaker series, you could be anything, right? 
Um, so this one's maybe a weird one when we talk about uh, this is a specific business principle. So <clears throat> when you think about negotiation, what, what do you feel like is a successful negotiation? If you're trying to work out a deal, what, what makes it a successful deal? If both parties end up happy. Okay, good. Anybody else? Ah, when neither, both happy or both but not happy. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, I've always heard that a good negotiation requires sacrifice on both parties. So each party gets something that they want, but not everything that they were hoping for. So they're both a little bit unhappy with the result. I like it. Good. But if, if I'm really a good negotiator, so if I'm good at negotiating, what should my outcome be? Okay. <laughs> you can measure your own success by saying that was a good job. I, you know, that property was really only worth a hundred thousand dollars, but I negotiated so well that I got it for three. Yeah. Really, when you think about somebody that's a good negotiator, how would you define them? Um, how they can arbitrate or compromise. You know? Kind of making it so that obviously both parties have to sacrifice, but finding the best way so that neither parties have to sacrifice too much. Okay. So if I go into a deal, and I'll just use real estate since that's what, what I do, Let's say there's a, a house listed for 500 k If I'm representing a buyer for that house, what is my job in helping that buyer buy that house? You need to convince them that this place is worth 500 k Oh, I do? Or you have to sacrifice... So how many of you would hire me if I convinced you to pay full price for a property. Nobody. <laughs> so what are you hiring me to do? To reduce the price by sure. Yeah. When you approach a negotiation, typically the idea is I want, if I'm buying, I want this price to be as low as possible. Right? Now if I'm representing the seller, what do I what's my job then? My job is to get this price as high as possible. So when it was crazy the last uh, few months, if, if any of you have noticed, you probably aren't house shopping, most of you, but over the last year, there was a significant increase in prices all over the country. Here was no exception. So when I would list a house, you know what we would do? We'd pick our price, and it was usually, let's say, the last comps sold at uh, 470000 Then we would, we would price it higher than the last comps because the market was doing this, right? And then we would tell people, all right, we'll put it on the market, but we're not going to look at offers for three to seven days. Why? Why would I do that? Because there were so few homes and so many buyers that this house would show 20 times in two days and we'd end up with 10 or 15 offers on the house. So what's that going to do to prices? Yeah, so if I'm doing my job, as a buyer's agent, do I convince them to pay that in that situation? What, what am I then having to do as a buyer's agent? If I know, if I, if I as an agent know there's going to be 15 offers on this house, what am I telling my buyer? So am I a very good negotiator? It's interesting, right? Like negotiation, when you think about it, the, when you think about negotiation, <laughs> you, you typically think of the idea of winning, right? Like if I'm doing a good job, then I'm going to win in that deal. I'm going I'm to make sure that I, I put the terms right, the price right, whatever it takes for me to get to win. Sometimes people don't feel like they win if they don't get it for 50000 less than what they're asking, right? 
they're probably not going to buy a house in the way the market was the last little while. Um, but negotiation to me is an interesting one because I don't view it, um, I don't view it so much as trying to win. And we accumulated our block. It's pretty rare, those of you that don't understand real estate very much, to find a, a block anywhere in the country that is six and a half acres continuous under one ownership is unheard of. It's really, really hard to find, to, to be able to get all of those different people to sell to the same person at the same, within the same time frame. Really, really rare. So if in order for me in that situation to have gone and be able to acquire all of those pieces, could I always view it as trying to get the cheapest or the best price? So really a good negotiation, you guys actually hit on it I think pretty good at the beginning, but it's, it's a, to be good at negotiating, you can't have it be about winners and losers. It has to be about what's a good deal for, what, for both people. What's a fair, reasonable deal for both people? And that would vary. So one of the ones that we did, uh, there was a guy where the uh, Bristlecone building, where Bristlecone is now. He, it, was a, it was an auto repair shop and parts, mechanic shop. And the guy that owned it um, just had no desire to sell. And the, the previous guy that we bought our hotels from had bugged him for years to try to get him to sell. Given him appraisals, offered him money, and nothing. So I went in and I met with him. And, well, I'll ask you guys. Tell me what you think. So that situation, you're going to approach somebody that doesn't have their, house, their property listed. They've got no desire to sell. How would you approach it? When you really want that thing, how would you approach it? Okay, so one option would be, well, everybody has a, I'll sell it at that price, right? So even if it was only worth five or 600,000, I could offer him a million and maybe he'd take it, right? So you could do that up here and then down here. Ah. Ah, good. There might be an emotional thing behind it. I like that. I think connected with that, it might be the value of, um, he might not, it, it, it's kind of a big process to go through, but you kind of build the value of him getting it off his hands and kind of build the value of what you do post owning that building. Okay, good. I like that. There was another hand here. Bingo. So a good negotiator, before they go present any kind of a deal, finds out what's important to the person on the other side. Think about that. Because that's not usually the way we do it. The business world, will, it's all about money, right? It's all about the terms of the deal. But if you can instead just go build a relationship with them, and this goes back to some of my other principles, Figure out how to make them feel like you're giving more than you're taking. And it may be different to them of what that is. It's, it's often not always about money. So this particular guy, his was 100% the headache. He's like, this is making me money. I've got no reason to sell it. It's in a good location. It's a headache to even go through dealing with it. Because if I sell it, I'm going to have to pay taxes. So I got to find another property to 1031 into in order to keep myself from paying taxes. It was a 100% headache. The previous guy that had tried to buy it never went and talked to him. He just would send him offers. It was all about money. Right? Up in the offer, trying to pay him more. He wouldn't sell. And so what we ended up doing is we went and said, hey, we're going to take away the headache. We're going to make this stress-free. So we're going to agree to this price. We're going to lease the property from you. So we'll guarantee you a lease, and we're going to lease the property from you. You have three years, three years to find another property to 1031 exchange into. And that whole time, we're going to be making you lease payments. And as soon as you find something, give us 60 days and we close. We took away the headache. 
Funny part was, guess, how, guess when he finally found a property? <laughs> he put it off for three years. <laughs> so he still procrastinated it and, and ended up having to rush to find something at the end. But, um, but we, we eliminated it. Um, there's the, the emotion one. I can't remember who said that one. Um, we've had that, that experience as well. So um, there was, a, there was a, a little house um, that I think he, he more than anything just wanted to, to believe that it was going to somebody that was a good person. And it, I, he'd been bugged by the previous owner too, but he, he felt like we were good people that were going to do good things. And that's all it took. It was an emotional thing for him. Um, so, you, so when you approach negotiation, I think that, again, you, you put on the hat of not having to win. And, and Rand's actually even harassed me about this sometimes because I, I don't go into the negotiation saying, I'm going to offer this, and then they're going to beat me up until we get to this price, and we go back and forth until we get there. I really do try to look at it from their perspective, and I just say, well, if I was them, this is what it would take for me to be willing to do it. And that's what I just go try to make happen and try to make it a, a fair, fair deal for them. So anyway, that was a little side note, one of a business specific thing, but any questions? We got, still got about 10 minutes. Yes. Um, what advice do you have for students that want to go into real estate? Uh, real estate as a profession or real estate investing? They're two different things. Oh, Both? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and I'll clarify the two because that's a good question. So. Real estate as a profession is, is selling property for other people, right? So I get my real estate license and then I represent clients in transactions and get paid a commission. So that's real estate as a profession. Um, real estate investing is very, very different. That's when I just go buy properties as investments to hopefully generate uh, passive income. So real estate as a profession, it's a, got a very low threshold of entry. So unlike being a dermatologist, Rand had to go through a lot of school to, to get to his, his profession. It, mine was 120 hours of, of classwork and pass a state test. So it's really easy to get into, uh, but the average real estate agent makes $26,000 a year. So people think, again, that it's pretty easy to make money in real estate as a profession. It's not. Um, it, it's, it takes a lot of, of work, especially in the first few years to get a client base built. Um, so relationships is the biggest part. If you want to, to do it as a profession, you've got to be somebody who uh, is very comfortable just talking to people and building relationships with people. And that's, that's personally how I view it. There's two, there's two models in real estate. One is a, a numbers approach where you talk to enough people and, and you get some deals from it. The other one is, is a, more of a quality approach, which that's the way I've chosen to do mine where we literally, so outside of my first year when I got started and did some marketing, I've, I've never marketed. I don't run a radio ad. I don't do any Facebook ads. I, I literally have done nothing to grow my personal real estate business. It's all off of relationships. So I just, I get random calls from somebody that said, hey, so-and-so told me to call you. And that's where my business comes from in real estate. Um, so that's, I, that's where I believe firmly. If you want to go into real estate, that's the kind of person that you have to to be and and grow it that way if you do it as an investing I think everybody should invest in real estate um, it's uh, and I'm biased yes you're laughing because he, yeah, the guy talking about real estate because he sells it um, but I, I really do love real estate as an investment tool but I've seen a lot of people make really bad decisions uh, because they think I'm just gonna go buy something and it just magically makes money. You still have to analyze it as an investment. Like I had one guy, a dentist in town that bought, um, he actually bought that house that I was telling you about on my first one for 250,000 that we bought for 80. He bought that house and it was at the peak of a cycle. And when he bought it, and I did not represent him, um, when he bought it, he, uh, I honestly looked at it and thought, somebody's buying this as a rental? There's no way this thing is in a cash flow. He's stupid. But he was basing it on, well, it'll save me money. Even if I have a loss, then I'll save money on my dentist income. And so it's still worth it because I can you know, deduct it as a loss against my other income. That's honestly the way he made his decision to buy that house. Any guesses on what happened when the market turned? 
He short sold it. <laughs> so I've seen a lot of people make stupid decisions in investing in real estate. You've got to view it through the lens of, um, like this is the most common one. People will, will look at it and say, oh, well, I'll, bet, I'll bet I can get 2000 a month for rents, which is the high end of the possibility of what they can get in rents. And my costs will only be X, which is the low end of what their costs would be. And that happens all the time as people project higher income and lower uh, costs than reality. And so you just got to really look at it and analyze it through that lens. So good question. What else? Any other questions for me? It's a great question. I personally have only invested here because it's what I know. Um, but I don't think it's wrong to necessarily invest other places as well. Uh, and part of that may be a little bit of my control freakness is I like to see it. Um, know the people that I'm renting to. I, I honestly don't love property managers, so we like to do a lot of ours ourselves because um, we'll always do it better than what somebody else will. So that's, that's the main reasons of why I've done it here, but it, it's all about the numbers. So if you can find somewhere where you have someone you really trust giving you the advice about the numbers, because that's the tricky part. If you go somewhere outside of where you're comfortable, you're relying almost 100% on other people's advice. And you just got to make sure you find the right people to give you advice. So when you buy a house, like what, what should I look at for if I'm investing or like any property? Um, so I cheat in that way too because I grew up doing construction. There's two things that I look at. You got to make sure that it's not a money pit. So. Uh, so you, you've got to have a pretty good idea of how to evaluate what it will, what potential costs could go into the house. Um, but outside of that, it's really just a numbers thing. You really just analyze what's my income, what's my expenses on it. And as long as that return and everybody will have a different number, I have a hard time buying something that we don't get close to about a 10% return on. Um, but everybody will have a different way of, of what their number is. It's just about, it really is about the math. But the, but the cost that can go into it is an important one. So I'll, I'll, give you, well, I'll give you two pieces of advice. So if your margin, let's say just buy a little duplex, and your margin on it is you're making about three, four hundred bucks a month, okay? If the roof goes bad, how much does the roof cost? Anybody? What'd you say? Ooh, you're pretty good. Yeah, you'll be right now. You'll probably be right around if you're talking about a 12, 1400 square foot footprint, about eight-ish grand is about where you'll be. So if my profit is three or four hundred bucks, but I buy a house that's going to need a new roof in in a year or two years, how long is it going to take me to actually make any money on that? <laughs> Not necessarily a great investment, right? Um, if you're wanting cash flow, if you're trying to generate cash flow. Um, so, so that's one piece. The second one is I always estimate low on my rents for this reason. If I estimate high, and that's what I base my numbers on, so I have to get, let's say, that $2,000 a month. If the market it, it turns even a little bit, and so you don't have a line of renters to come rent it, am I going to get the 2000 Maybe, but will I get it the same day the other tenant moved out? Probably not. So I might end up sitting vacant for a couple months. And now if I didn't make my three or $400 a month of profit and instead I'm having to pay all of my expenses without any income, I just lost money really fast because I sat vacant for a month or two. So I always choose to, to set my rent rates a little lower so that I fill them immediately. So there's somebody coming in right behind them rather than try to push them an extra 100 or 200 bucks and, and risk being vacant. So that's another little tip on, on uh, playing those margins to make sure that you, you're profitable. Melbourne. Why? Uh, my dad serves in, um, in Sydney. Cool. 
Awesome. We've got time for one more question. Yeah, so I've only invested in Cedar, so that's, again, what I know. Um, I cheat because I'm an agent, right? So I'm in it every day, seeing new listings, seeing what things sell at. So you have to just be in the data. You have to just, in order to learn and understand the market, you just have to be in the data. And I'm a big believer in data, so I'll watch. Inventory numbers is the main one that I watch, so you you can predict, and th this is actually a good advice. Anybody that wants to invest in real estate, take notes on this. And th this is really like the main thing to, to predict what's gonna happen in real estate. So um, I call it the uh, demand or inventory numbers, but you take in any market, so if you go and buy anything anywhere, ask your agent for these things. What is the total number of active listings? How many sell per month on average? So if you take a six month sales time period, if there's 600 homes that have sold, you divide that by six, there's 100 homes selling a month, right? So you find out how many sell per month, how many are currently active, and then it's a ratio of the two. So if there's, if there's 100 homes selling a month and there's 100 homes currently on the market, we have one month of inventory. So if nothing else listed, the volume of sales would eat up everything that is currently on the market within a month. Okay, so that's the ratio you're looking for. Now here's what those numbers mean. If you're below about, about a five-ish month, give or take a little bit, is a stable market. Meaning prices are not gonna go up, they're not gonna go down because there's enough homes for the number of buyers that prices kind of hold steady. When you get lower than that, then there's pressure on price. There's more buyers than there are homes, so price will tend to trend up. You get above that, and there's too many homes, not enough buyers, and prices will tend to trend down. Which kind of market do you want to buy in? A lot of people that are wanting to buy? Yeah. Correct. Because that means pri you're going to get a better deal, right? Prices are being pushed down, so that's a buyer's market. Um, and you especially want to know where you're at in that cycle of did it just start to turn like that or has it been going down for a couple of years and then you're able to buy at the bottom of the market. So that one thing, if you just watch inventory numbers, you can predict what's going to happen to, to home prices. What's our inventory numbers right now? We're about, we're about one month currently. Um, we were, so we were six months ago at 0.2 months of inventory. Wrap your head around that, 0.2 months of inventory. When the market crashed in 2009, we had 18 months of inventory. So really that one number, if you remember nothing else of anybody that wants to invest in real estate, that one thing is how you can uh, just get that data and you'll be able to predict what's gonna happen. Yes, yep. Okay. Thank you so much, Steve Nelson. Okay.